Welcome to Shattered Reality with your hosts Kate Valentine and Farusha. Prepare to have your paradigms shifted and your truths questioned. And now, Shattered Reality. Shattered Reality. Well, hello, Shattered Reality listeners. Um, I'm very happy to be here today on January 15th, 2019. This is our first podcast of the new year, and I certainly hope it won't be the last. I do hope it will be the last podcast that doesn't have Kate Valentine with us. She has been missing for a little while, and we are hoping to welcome her back in the coming weeks. So I believe this is number 82 of the podcast, and we're going to start in right away. I'm going to save all the other notes for the end of the podcast because we have a very special guest joining us today, someone who is across the pond. So it's a little bit later there than it is here, and we don't want to inconvenience him not one little bit. He is a very, very well-known scientist, uh, internationally recognized, a PhD, perhaps more than once over, and he is as Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, a biologist and author of more than 85 scientific papers and 12 books. He was a fellow of Clare College, Cambridge University, a Frank Knox Fellow at Harvard University and a research fellow of the Royal Society. From 2005 to 2010, he was the director of the Parrot Warwick Project, funded by Trinity College at Cambridge. He is a fellow of the Institute of Noetic Sciences in Petaluma, California, and of Shoemaker College in Devon, England. And his latest book is Science and Spiritual Practices, Transformative Experiences, and Their Effects on Our Bodies, Brains, and Health. So I would like to welcome Dr. Rupert Sheldrake. Hello, Rupert. Hello. I'm very pleased to be with you. Well, I am extraordinarily pleased to have you on. And um, what I would like to start with is because most everyone who would be listening to this podcast will have already heard your name. I cannot guarantee that they have all read your books. I myself have read four of your books and hope to make it more in the not-too-distant future. However, what I think that Um, you are most well known for is for promoting and expanding the hypothesis of morphic resonance. Would you agree with that? I suppose so, yes. Um, And I think that just to make it real clear for the people who know your name but don't know your work, which I would say maybe, you know, 30% of our listeners, the other uh, 70% probably have some concept of what it is. Could you just give us a little background on, on the hypothesis of morphic resonance? Yes, it's basically the idea that there's a memory in nature, that there's a kind of a collective memory in each species and in each kind of thing. And in its most general sense, the idea that the laws of nature are actually more like habits. The universe is basically habit forming. And evolution involves the development of new habits rather than everything being run by fixed laws that were all there at the moment of the Big Bang, like a kind of cosmic Napoleonic code. So, um, the, the actual way in which the memory or the habits work is what I mean by morphic resonance. Similar patterns of activity resonate across time with subsequent similar patterns of activity. And the result of this is that each species has a kind of collective memory, not just of behavior, but of form. So every time a foxglove plant develops, uh, it's tuning into the kind of memory of the foxglove form from previous foxgloves. Uh, It's inheriting genes, of course, which enable it to make the right proteins, but the form is shaped by morphic resonance. And um, every time 
a, a giraffe develops, a baby giraffe is tuning into a kind of giraffe collective memory. And when the baby is born, it then tunes into the memory of instincts of that species. So instincts are a kind of habit of the species. Um, this is a testable hypothesis, and it's been tested uh, successfully so far. And it predicts that if you make a new chemical for the first time and crystallize it, uh, the first crystals may take a long time to form. Uh, a new pattern has to come into being in nature. But the more often you crystallize it, the easier it gets. And in fact, that's what chemists have known for a long time. New compounds get easier to crystallize all around the world. Huh. Uh, um, they often assume this is because fragments of previous crystals have been wafted around in the atmosphere um, and have settled out uh, as dust. Um, but um, th this uh, happens uh, even if dust particles are filtered out. And um, also, if you train rats to learn a new trick, say in New York, then rats all around the world should thereafter be able to learn it quicker in London, in Melbourne, Australia, and so on just because the rats have landed in New York without any normal means of communication. That's why this hypothesis is surprising and uh, indeed controversial, because mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, suggesting something that's not part of regular science, but which I think makes a great more say, much more sense out of evolution, inheritance, um, and indeed memory. I have a few questions about that, or um, maybe statements. Uh, how does this how does this relate to uh, epigenetics as opposed to regular uh, genetic selection? Um, in other words, a, a gene gets to be expressed or not expressed, and uh, perhaps we consciously might have some control over that, or maybe uh, the morphic resonance has some control over that. Does that make sense? Yes. I mean, in, until about the year 2000, um, Regular biologists um, claimed that every bit of inheritance essentially was genetic, apart from so-called cytoplasmic inheritance and cultural inheritance. Um, and they were dead against the idea of the inheritance of acquired characters. That was, in fact, a heresy, so-called Lamarckian inheritance. Um, but since the year 2000, it's now become mainstream, and it's now generally agreed there is an inheritance of acquired characters. Um, people assume that it's all due to changes in the molecular um, control of DNA expression, and I think that certainly plays a part. Uh, but I think some of it could be morphic resonance uh, as well, or instead. Uh, for example, in some recent experiments, um, published in Nature, the leading international scientific journal, uh, people did experiments with mice. Um, they trained the fathers to be averse to a particular smell, a chemical called acetophenone. Um, when they smelt it, they got a mild electric shock, and so as soon as they smelt it, they became frightened. They then took sperm from these mice, artificially inseminated females, which never met the fathers, um, and their offspring and their grandchildren um, had an instant fear of the smell of acetophenone. And when this was published, it was in the paper was called Inheriting the Fears of Fathers. So here's an inheritance of acquired characteristics, um, which people assume must be due to um, epigenetic molecular mechanisms, but could equally well, perhaps more plausibly, be explained in terms of morphic resonance. No one knows how it works um, in this case. Um, but that's an example of the new kind of research that's going on uh, under the general heading of epigenetic inheritance. What really hit it for me, that really hit the spot, if you will, was uh, what you spoke about ayahuasca, because it never really made sense to me that when people take ayahuasca, I haven't, I'm interested in it, but I haven't had the guts to do it. <laughs> but when people take ayahuasca, they do see tropical scenes, the, the, uh, the insects and the serpents sometimes are there and other animals, and it's all like the Andean tropics, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, this never seemed to make 
make a whole lot of sense to me. But when you add the idea of morphic resonance to it, it suddenly, you see, you get that head slap and say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yes, well, I agree. This is a very interesting case. And there are, okay, there are recorded reports of people taking ayahuasca in modern urban settings who know nothing about its shamanic background in the, in the Amazon in region in South America. Um, and in cultures where there's lots of mythology about serpents and jaguars and so on. And they have visions of serpents and jaguars. Um, now, what I think is happening is that there's a kind of inherent memory there, a collective memory. When you take ayahuasca, the effect on your brain or my brain is very similar to the effect on the brains of people who've taken it before. And that creates the conditions of similarity for morphic resonance. So there's a kind of resonance from the people who've taken it before, a kind of collective memory of ayahuasca takers, which includes these Amazonian mythologies and imagery. Um, and it's not just ayahuasca. The, um, the famous Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman, who uh, discovered LSD, uh, was asked to analyze the active principles of magic mushrooms from Mexico. He was doing this research in Basel, Switzerland. Um, and uh, when he took these mushrooms himself, he knew they came from Mexico, but he got very sort of Mexican, Aztec-type imagery. Um, you could say that was suggestion. He knew they were from Mexico, but he isolated the psilocybin, the active principle, um, and then gave it to other Swiss people who didn't know uh, where this came from. And they also had Mexican type imagery. So this, again, uh, suggests that there's a kind of collective memory uh, based on the specific conditions created by these drugs. So this is one particular instance of a possible effect of morphic resonance. I will just, the, the Mexican references brought back to my mind a memory, a personal memory that I have of going to Chichen Itza um, a number of years ago. And I was in the company of uh, a group of other young people, four or five people traveling in a larger group, but we hung out together. And uh, one of the gentlemen had a Super 8 movie camera, which was something people did at that time. And we went to the top of the, uh, the one of the pyramids where persons were sacrificed. And um, I w was a spiritual person even at that time, and I was somewhat reverent. And he was making fun of me, and he was making fun of the situation. And I said, really, do not do that. I think it's a very bad idea. And when he got his Super 8 movie uh, stuff back, his... his uh, his film back, uh, it, that part of the film was all like dripping blood. <laughs> and there's no other explanation for it. But when he got up to the top of the, uh, the pyramid, I guess it might have been the Pyramid of the Sun, and, um, and he was making fun of my reverence, he, he got a film back that was just looked like rolling, dripping blood. So hopefully that uh, straightened him out a little bit. Moving on with the uh, morphic resonance, uh, how about the hundredth, is it the hundredth monkey theory that people always refer to? Uh, would you say that is, that sounds like a, a straightforward shot for morphic resonance, is it? Um, well, unfortunately not, no. No, um, okay. It's the basic principle is uh, illustrates morphic resonance, but the story itself um, isn't terribly reliable. Um, what happened was that there were these scientists in Japan studying monkeys on islands, and they wanted to study the monkeys um, uh, where they could see them. So they took along sacks of sweet potatoes and put them on the beach, so the monkeys came out of the forest. And then the monkeys on one of the islands learned to wash the sand off the sweet potatoes in the sea, and these Japanese scientists, when they went to other islands after a while, found that this behavior seemed to spread to other islands. Now, that is what happened, and it looks very like morphic resonance. But the British writer Lyle Watson heard this story in Japan, 
And he wrote about it in one of his books, and he sort of improved the story, and he says he's improving it. He says, let us imagine that on a particular day, one extra monkey, say the hundredth monkey, uh, learned this trick. Suddenly, all the monkeys everywhere in Japan started doing it. Mm. So, you see, he improved the story, and then people in the anti-nuclear movement heard the story, and they improved it even further. And um, every time it was told, it sort of got more and more impressive till though these monkeys suddenly started digging up sweet potatoes. And, <laughs> and, and so the story improved with each re retelling. And then the dogmatic skeptics got hold of it and they were able to show that nothing like this had really happened. And they said they debunked the whole thing and um, they, they, it was nothing but a myth and so on. Um, so... It's not quite as straightforward as it seems. Many people have heard this story. Um, they've heard various versions of it. It does actually point towards something like morphic resonance and started from observations that suggest something like morphic resonance. But in its form that it's usually related, um, it's an exaggeration. With morphic resonance, for example, the more that learn it, the easier it gets elsewhere. This is what the experiments with rats show. Um, there have been a whole series of experiments with rats that show these morphic resonance effects. It's not like that story suggests that nothing happens till you get to one extra rat and suddenly they all do it. Um, it's, that su suggests a kind of step function. It's more like a curve, you know, mm -hmm. do it the easier it gets. So it's even slightly misleading about the actual effect. Well, um, I'm glad you were able to set that straight. Uh, Lyle Watson, unfortunately, I think deceased at this point, was a, an extremely interesting writer, but maybe uh, spread the truth a little bit. Well, he said in his book, he actually said, you know, let us assume. He didn't say, um, you know, this is what really happened. He said, let us assume that this happened, and then for the sake of argument. He makes it clear that he's exaggerating. Okay. But all that was left out when people repeated the story. All righty. Well, he's, he's a very interesting author, and I, I enjoy his writing in any case. Uh, so let's move on to your latest book, Science and Spiritual Practices, Transformative Experiences and Their Effects on Our Bodies, Brains, and Health. Now, this book is uh, available in the U.S. and um, around the, the English-speaking world, I suspect, and it's from CounterPoint. Uh, books, and I'm just giving a little a little commercial here for you. And anytime you want to uh, put something like that in, please do, uh, because I'm not always cognizant of doing it at regular intervals. So um, you, you number several um, actions that can be taken uh, that can um, transform the person each individual person, and, and improve the person's body, brain, and health. And you start out with meditation. So um, would you like to talk about that a little bit? Yes. Well, in this book, Science and Spiritual Practices, I discuss seven different spiritual practices, um, which have been studied scientifically. And these practices all have measurable effects. Um, generally speaking, the effects are very positive. People who have regular religious or spiritual practices tend to be happier, healthier, and live longer. Um, so, I mean, these are very, very beneficial effects. And of course, millions of people now meditate around the world. About 18 million people in the US meditate. I mean, it's huge numbers. Um, so, meditation has been uh, studied quite intensively for nearly 40 years now. Um, and what these studies show is that um, people who meditate regularly tend to have lower blood, blood pressure, less stress, sleep better, um, and um, have more effective lives. So the, it has very beneficial effects on people's lives, which is why a lot of people do it. And it's now taught in schools, colleges, and even in some prisons, um, it, so, and, and it's quite widely practiced. It also affects the functioning of the brain, even leading to anatomical changes in brains. Um, so I think the beneficial effects of meditation are now very well documented. And here in Britain, 
Uh, you can even get a prescription for meditation from a psychiatrist if you have mild or moderate depression, because, uh, as you know, we have a free health service here, and uh, they're always trying to cut the costs. Um, and it, it turns out that um, meditation works as well, if not better, than antidepressant drugs for mild or moderate depression, and of course has no side effects and is very much cheaper. So that's why you can now actually get prescriptions for a course of meditation training um, in, in, on the National Health Service. Well, that's great. That's, that's a wonderful benefit. Yes, I think it is a great benefit. I think the, the bit that um, I, the, the, the evidence about meditation is clear. Um, I mean, there may be a few people it doesn't benefit, but most people who try it uh, have a positive effect. Um, and it doesn't presuppose any particular religious um, or spiritual belief system. In fact, quite a number of atheists now meditate, in, including some prominent public atheists. Mm. Uh, Harris, the so-called new atheist, uh, now gives online meditation courses. So um, it, that's a particularly interesting feature of it. But in its traditional setting, in Buddhism or Hinduism or in contemplative prayer in Christianity, um, where meditation has been practiced for centuries, uh, even millennia in, in, in the East, um, people weren't doing it so they could be more effective in love and business or have lower blood pressure. They were doing it because they thought it took them to the very ground of consciousness itself, which linked them to the source of all consciousness, the idea all religions have the idea there's a conscious source beyond the world um, and that our consciousness can link directly to that because it's in effect part of it. Now for materialists and atheists, um, meditation is just affecting their brains, it's all happening inside their head, it's not linking them to something out there. Um, I myself think there are forms of consciousness beyond the human level and meditation can link us to them. I agree. Uh, so, but for most meditators, they don't think much about that. They just do it. But I think through doing it, people often have experiences that take them beyond this rather limited materialist view of consciousness being confined to the brain um, and actually change their worldview, opening up to the idea of greater spiritual realities. Well, um, just to get into uh, the, the concept of uh, it being either, um, a, you know, an atheist can do it, a spiritual person can do it, or a religious person can do it, um, it does seem to me to be that um, the religious person would have a framework already in existence with most major religions in which to practice it, whereas a spiritual person may be able to meditate very well, but lack the community uh, to work with, and that might uh, be a hindrance on some level. Uh, on the other hand, um, talking about different methods of of meditation, one of which is a re repetition, a wazifa, a mantra, a, a a small prayer, you know, as just a sort of statement prayer that could be repeated. That's one way to get into it that uh, uh, you have mentioned and I have experienced. Another is the breathing method, uh, using certain kinds of breath, which I find very troubling for me because I, I, I it it's, doesn't work for me at all. But I want to. I wanted to suggest a third method, um, which would be entering through the body, like becoming aware of uh, a, a graduated relaxation method, or even I get very joyful simply by thinking about the soles of my feet and putting the, my consciousness into the soles of my feet. It gives me, I can't explain it, but it gives me great joy. Do you want to speak a little bit about, about that? Well, I've never tried putting my consciousness in the soles of my feet. <laughs> I, I do meditate regularly, but I, I, I um, um, yes, I think the point about meditation is that um, you set up a focus of concentration or attention different from the chatter that's going on in your mind, which is an activity of the so-called default mode network, which is a series of brain act regions that are linked up together, involved in rumination or internal 
dialogue. Um, mantras provide one focus. If by focusing on the mantra, it sort of takes you away from all that. Breathing is another, and obviously in your case, uh, the soles of the feet uh, are a, another method. I mean, mindful uh, meditative walking is another practice that happens in some Zen traditions, in other Oriental traditions as well. Um, it doesn't seem to matter too much where you put your attention, as long as it's taken away from the, it drains the energy out of the normal obsessive thought processes that we're trapped in, and uh, opens up a space, a gap, uh, where we can be aware that our minds are larger than the thoughts that are going through them. It's as if um, our normal thoughts are like clouds going through the sky, and we're normally completely uh, in, enclosed in them and, and, sweat and caught up with them. But meditative techniques enable one to sort of step back and then realize that there's the ground of our consciousness is more like the sky itself rather than the clouds going through it, the, the basis of our whole conscious life. And that connects with uh, the ultimate source of consciousness, um, you know, or the ground of all being. Yes, uh, I, which could be thought of as God or the universal consciousness or all that is, or any of that. those sorts of words. Um, and uh, we get at this point, uh, I have two thoughts here. The walking meditation kind of brings us into your last uh, your last spiritual practice, the pilgrimage, because a lot of a pilgrimage could be uh, walking meditation, but we're going to we'll leave that for a little bit later in our discussion. The other thing is, of course, the argument, uh, what is known as the hard problem of consciousness and um, whether we shall decide or think that the the uh, physical brain is a reducing valve for uh, consciousness to be expressed through our bodies and that the greater consciousness lies beyond the actual brain, the mind, hooking up with um, higher self, universal consciousness, God, other, perhaps other entities, non-physical entities. Mm. Yes. Well, I, I, think, I think that puts it very well. Yes. I, and... Um I think, you, you see, I, uh, your point about this um, being rather individualistic practice is, is also true. And that's why in my book I also discuss other spiritual practices which are more collective that link us or connect us to other people. One of them is chanting and singing. And this is part of all religious traditions. Um, they all have singing and chanting. And there have been a lot of studies now which show that when you're singing together or chanting together, um, uh, you, your whole body resonates with the sound. You resonate with other people because you're doing it together. You take breaths at the same time, you're making the same sounds. And if you're chanting a sacred song or sound or mantra, then by morphic resonance, which we've already discussed, by, because it's similar, you connect up with those who've done it before. So there's a connection across time. And the same goes for rituals, all religions and Many secular social groups have rituals, and by repeating the ritual the way it's been done before, more or less the same way it's been done in the past, you create the conditions for morphic resonance, so there's a presence of the past, a connection across time with previous generations, right back to the first time the ritual happened. And this is something that happens in religious rituals like the Jewish uh, Passover, or the Christian Holy Communion. Also in national rituals like the American Thanksgiving dinner, uh, where people reenact a particular event that was of key importance in the history of the group. In the case of America, the first settlers in New England uh, giving thanks for their Thanksgiving for the surviving and, and the, the fact the land had sustained them uh, over the first year. Um, uh, these uh, rituals uh, connect us with each other and with those before. So they're much more connective socially, um, whereas meditation is more individualistic. So it's not, in my view, these, these practices, not either or, it's both and, which is why these are three of the practices I include in my book. Yes, uh, and, and, and very well done, I must say. In terms of rituals, I have a particular... Uh, 
relationship to rituals that um, might be even new for people to do, um, I find that um, I, you know, I have clients who come and ask me for advice in various ways and are not able to train their minds very easily. Uh, They're not able to just lay down and meditate, for instance. But um, if you give a person a small ritual to do, like gazing into a candle, uh, having certain objects in front of them, they are forced to <laughs> to concentrate on something. And therefore, uh, what they intend, their intention is more likely to happen Also, if you do an intention with a group, it would seem that the intention is pushed a little bit further. Now, this is not the same as a meditation, obviously, because there is um, a purpose to it, a specific purpose, like you you want to find a partner, let's say, in life, as many of my clients do. And so doing a ritual with others with an intention uh, multiplies the uh, effects of the the intention and the mind is uh, focused on on the ritual and thereby uh, the uh, affirmation is pushed further, the intention is pushed further. I think that some of the... Uh, the people at the Society for Scientific Exploration, which I assume you're familiar with, uh, the, the Dean Radin, Julia Mosper Bridge Group, um, somebody measured the amount, and I wish I, I knew this, who did, but measured the amount uh, th- 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 that was improved of having more than one person do an intention. Like if you have one person intending uh, strongly, maybe there's an 8% better chance that that will happen. But if you start adding people, it can go up to 12 or 15 percent. I wish I knew the person that actually did that experiment. It may have been replicated as well, but it seems to come out of that general group. Hmm. I'm not familiar with that particular experiment. I am familiar with the group. I'm a member of the Society for Scientific Exploration myself. You and me both. Hey, hey. (laughs) Okay. So, um, um, well, I think that this, you know, all traditional societies um, have these collective practices, which is what going to church or to synagogue or taking part in a, a, you know, in a Buddhist new moon ceremony or, um, or shamanic ceremonies in tribal cultures where they celebrate and dance and sing together. All of these are ways of linking people's intentions together. And, you know, in church services and in synagogues, people are praying together um, and in mosques. And I think that these are are very traditional ways of linking up with others. Basically, these spiritual practices are about connection. um, And they connect us with the ground of being. They connect us with other people. They connect us with ancestors. They connect us with places, as in pilgrimage. Um, So they're all ways of making us more connected. And typically, people feel happier when they're connected and unhappier when they're not. So they also have the effect of making people happier. Indeed. As as does your second second, uh, spiritual practice, which is gratitude. And um, my suggestion, and I think this is probably, I believe, is your suggestion also, have a little gratitude when you wake up in the morning and a little gratitude when you go to sleep at night, and it does uh, tend to make you a happier person, one happier person. Definitely. I mean, there's now a lot of research done by psychologists, particularly in the School of Positive Psychology, uh, which is the branch of psychology studying well-being and happiness, um, that by being more grateful, you can become happier. Uh, there are now uh, experiments and exercises that people do that make people measurably happier um, through the practice of gratitude. And this is something all religions encourage. They all have thanksgiving um, for our ble- uh, the blessings in our lives. Um, and it's now scientifically shown that this is really does work. People really are happier. And I think it's because they feel more connected. If you receive something and you don't give thanks, basically it stops with you. 
if you receive something and give thanks, it, it creates a circuit, a flow, and being part of a flow is, is essential, really, for, for well-being in humans and, I suppose, in all nature. Um, so, and I myself find that um, the practice of gratitude is a really important thing. I try, before I go to bed in the evenings, uh, uh, at night I, I pray every evening, and I always start by giving thanks uh, for the things that have happened that day and for which I feel grateful. And the simplest way to bring this into one's life, as I suggest in my book, Science and Spiritual Practices, um, is to give thanks before meals. Then we can do it with other people. And saying grace before meals is an extremely traditional practice in all traditions. Um, but many people in the modern secular world have stopped doing it or are embarrassed by doing it or uh, whatever. But this, is, I think, is a loss. And the simplest way of doing it without causing controversy, is simply to hold hands round the table silently. Um, then everyone can give thanks in their own way, um, or to sing a grace together, or for someone to say a grace. But doing it silently is the easiest uh, way of doing it um, without sort of embarrassing anyone or raising any issues. And then it can move on from that to uh, a, a expression through words or song. Um, anyway, I think this is a very helpful and simple practice. We always do it uh, before meals in my home here in London. Well, I think that is uh, that is an excellent idea, as well as uh, the morning practice of of greeting the sun through uh, the Gaitriya mantra or um, a uh, a uh, sun salutation or both. Uh, and I'm I'm I, I'm a yogini, so I do enjoy uh, doing a lot of yoga and that sort of thing. And I I can tell you that it does absolutely make you feel better. But I wanted to just take a look at the other side of that, um, which is that, you know, we all have complaints in life. There are things that go wrong, and we we have every right to mention when something goes wrong. But there are those folks out there who have, through habit, um, decided that uh, a, a life of verbal complaints or uh, expressing what they feel is missing constantly to all who come and hear, uh, this gives them a little more attention for the moment. But in the long run, I believe they end up being losers in the situation. Well, that's certainly what the data show. The positive psychology people have found that people who are grateful are not only happier, but they're more popular. I mean, it's more fun being with someone who's happy and positive than someone who feels entitled and miserable and is complaining all the time. And, of course, it's important to be able to share our problems with others. That's part of being part of a social group, and that means we don't have to bear all our burdens by ourselves. But uh, not many people enjoy hanging out with people who just complain or moan all the time. Um, <laughs> Indeed, indeed. So um, basically, uh, we're going to move towards uh, your concept of more than the human world and a word that is new to me, uh, which I believe is pronounced panentheism. Yes, that's right. Um, well, in, in, in the, um, my chapter on the, um, in Science and Spiritual Practices, on uh, reconnecting with the more than human world. Um, it's basically about relating to nature. And for many people, um, being outdoors, hiking in, par in parks, being in gardens, um, and just being out in nature on the seaside by a river, sailing on the sea, um, these are all ways of connecting with the more than human world, because after all, we're pretty small compared with the whole planet Earth and the whole solar system and the entire galaxy. Um, and for many people, these um, exercises um, or, or just practices uh, give them a sense that there's a greater life in nature, that, that plants are truly alive, animals are truly alive, the heavens are truly alive. We're not just living in a dead mechanical uh, world, the world that mechanistic science portrays. Um, there's much more to it than that. And when we feel that sense of connection with nature and connection with that which is beyond us, 
um, we have the feeling that we're, there's a larger form of life in the world. It's uh, the, the conventional scientific view is that consciousness is just a kind of bubble inside human brains and the rest of nature is dead, mechanical um, and inanimate. Uh, but that's not how it feels when you relate to nature in this kind of living way. So um, even within science, there's a growing movement to understand the natural world uh, in terms of what's called panpsychism. Mm -hmm. Panpsychism is, pan means everywhere, psyche means mind, or as in psychology, from the Greek word psyche meaning soul. Um, so panpsychism um, is the idea that nature is actually alive. It's very similar to what's always been called animism. Mm -hmm the belief that nature is alive, not dead. Um, and if you take the view that the Earth is alive, Gaia, many people believe that, and I rightly so, I think that the solar system is a living organism, the whole galaxy is like a gigantic organism, the whole cosmos is like a vast living being with its own mind, the cosmic mind. Um, that view is animism or panpsychism. Um, it's sometimes also called pantheism, the idea that nature is God and God is nature, and God is like the mind of nature. But there's a further view, um, panentheism, which you asked about, mm -hmm. um, which, you, which goes further. It says, yes, nature is alive. Yes, God is in nature. Yes, all these things reflect divine being, the trees, the, the rivers, the seas, the skies, the stars. But it's not just nature. that uh, God is not just in nature, but nature is in God. So God transcends nature as well as being in nature. God is both transcendent and imminent. And so that's the view I take myself. And I think it's a, a, a better view than the, there are three alternative views that we had come across. One is materialist atheist view. There's no God. There's no mind or spirit in nature, it's just machinery, and our own minds are nothing but the activity of our brains. How we depressing that is. <laughs> That's the default view of most scientists and, of indeed, many educated people. It's very, very depressing, yes. Then there's the view, you, you, a view that you sometimes get with a, a certain kind of theistic religion, that nature is automatic and and just like the materialists think, is mechanical. But there's a God beyond nature who may have designed the machinery of nature in the first place and started it off. And that God is totally transcendent outside nature, and nature itself is not divine, it's not, it's not, has no spiritual value. That's a view that you encounter with some theists. It, some religious people have that view. Um, then you have the animist view that nature's alive and God, there isn't a God out there beyond nature, there's just nature. That's a kind of romantic um, uh, religion of nature. Um, so we've got these different views, but then the view that I think is much more inclusive is that, yes, God is immanent within nature. God in nature is alive. God's within nature. But God is also beyond nature, including nature. And so pan -en theism. Pan means everywhere, uh, N means in, theism means God. So God is in nature, and nature is in God. And I think that's by far the most satisfactory view. Um, it's also the view that uh, came naturally to Christians and, and Jews uh, before the scientific revolution in the, in the um, Middle Ages in Europe, the ages that gave us the great Gothic cathedrals of uh -huh. Europe. Um, Nature was seen as alive, and God was the God of the living world. And that, I think, is much the best view, and one that makes most sense to me. Well, is, is, could we extrapolate that to something that I think about in terms of when I think of Christianity, and I think of the Holy Ghost, uh, what is called the Holy Ghost, which is, if you just... Uh, you know, go to Sunday school, it's sort of like a, a real mystery. But when you think of that aspect of, of, the, of the Godhead as being what is inside everyone and inside all plants, all animals, the earth, the stars, the solar system, uh, the galaxy, all of that stuff is sort of 
what it is the makeup of uh, the Holy Ghost on on some level you could equate it. That's uh, that's somehow the way the way that I see it. Um, I I don't want to go down the road too too much of religion per se as you know Christianity as opposed to Judaism as opposed to Islam or uh, the Eastern religions, but rather to just sort of. Um, Think of that in terms of the philosophy of it, and also um, begin to talk about your uh, discussion, uh, which I heard online, is the sun conscious, which I found to be a wonderful, wonderful discussion. Yes, well, I, I think, first of all, the point about the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit is that there's an energetic principle in nature. All, all the great religions have the idea that there's uh, the, the divine nature has two main ways of interfacing with the world. One is through forms, patterns, structure, meaning, words, the logos in the Holy Trinity, or, um, you know, the word. Um, and the other is through movement, breath, change, wind, and what we call energy within science, all these different forms of energy. And that these are both uh, ways in which the divine works through the world. Um, and the, the, within modern science, the formative principle is expressed through fields, and the um, spirit principle is expressed through energy. And when we look at the sun, um, most people who are educated scientifically assume the sun is just uh, a sort of huge hydrogen bomb in the sky working mechanically. But actually, the sun itself is a source of energy. All the energy we have here on Earth comes from it, or nearly all of it. Um, uh, but it, And it represents just these two principles. It has a shape, a form, which comes from its gravitational field. The sun spots, the uh, flares, the act pulsing activity of the sun uh, all comes through the electromagnetic fields, which are shaping it. So fields are what shape it, give it form. Um, and then it's emitting all this energy, the sunlight and the flares and all the things that come, uh, that power life on Earth, uh, the constant flow of energy from the sun, um, is, in, as it were, the spirit principle um, and uh, the, the flow of energy. If we have a view of a living world, it's not just inanimate energy, it's living spirit that's coming to us from the sun. And traditional um, religious views have always seen the sun as alive. Um, that's why in the Hindu tradition, uh, the Gayatri Mantra, which is a hymn to the sun, which you mentioned earlier, um, is one of the most fundamental mantras in Hinduism. And one of the most basic yoga exercises, salutation to the sun, Surya Namaskar, which you do and I, which I do, I do that every morning, have done for more than 40 years. Um, is a, a way of recognizing the source of light and life here on Earth. Um, I myself think that the sun uh, is a conscious being, um, that, and so are the other stars, and so is the entire galaxy. Um, and um, we're, of course, schooled to think of the sun as just being an inanimate mechanism. That's the standard mechanistic, materialist worldview that we're educated in at schools and in colleges and universities. Um, but all traditional cultures have seen the sun as alive, and the, the earth as alive too, Gaia, Mother Earth. Um, I think it makes more sense of what we know about the sun and the stars to think of them as alive, as dead. Now, of course, they don't reproduce in the same way that uh, biological organisms do. Um, uh, but they do have life cycles. They are born, they grow through a phase of maturation and, and finally senescence, and then they die. Stars have a life cycle, so do planets. Um, so um, I think that it affects the way we relate to the world around us when we think of the more than human world, including the sun, as alive and as channels of the spirit which works through all nature and uh, is part of uh, the the divine activity in all nature. I I agree uh, with that point of view very largely. I agree. I kind of feel when I speak about this to people, I have to 
uh, define as you sort of did uh, a little bit about not, you know, the sun doesn't have baby sons necessarily and uh, so forth. So that there is, uh, there, there's biologically breathing being alive, which is one thing that a biological organism breathes or uh, uh, res- uh, has uh, respiration in the case of uh, plants. And uh, that is one form of being alive. Then there's consciousness and then there's self-consciousness. So there's a lot of gradations in there as to what we might mean. But moving into the science aspect, which you are better uh, better uh, to speak of than I can, because it's just a little bit above my pay grade, I do understand that uh, much of the sun's energy and the energy of the world that we live in is electromagnetic, and we only sense a certain bandwidth of the electromagnetic spectrum through our eyes and our ears, so that much of the communication, let's say, between the sun and the earth, which I believe is going on constantly, and um, you made me think more about the uh, the communication between the sun and other stars and the entire galaxy when I heard your, uh, your lecture there on that. Um, is it possible that there's a whole lot of communication going on that as biological entities we are not aware of, but through meditation and, and, and getting out of, out of the body, in essence, uh, we are able to connect with? Does that make sense? Well, I think so. I mean, the, the relating to nature is, is, you know, we can do it sometimes by a direct experience. Very often people have a kind of mystical experience when they're outdoors in the natural world of connection with the earth, with the sky, with the sun, with the stars. And I think that is a real connection, not just an imaginary thing inside brains. I think we can have these connections. We are. Everything in the universe is interconnected. And after all, at the very foundations of uh, science in the 17th century uh, was Newton's theory of gravitation. And what Newton was saying is that every particle of matter in the universe attracts every other particle of matter in the entire universe. It was basically, even at the heart of conventional science, is this vision of universal interconnectedness. Um, not separation, but interconnectedness. And interconnectedness at a distance. The gravitational interconnectedness works through empty space over universal distances. Um, So um, I don't think it's just simply a fantasy or an illusion to think of these connections. We really are connected, and we really are connected to distant stars by the light they emit, which means through the electromagnetic field. Um, So I think all of these things uh, uh, we know through science, and science has helped us know them much better than anyone knew them before. But they're usually dismissed as just physical interconnections. Um, And the universe is usually regarded as just dead. But you see, I think that um, life involves, uh, in biology, it involves things like reproduction, excretion, etc. But I think that basically what it's about is self-organization and having Uh, an organism having its own purposes and goals and the ability to organize itself. It may or may not be conscious. Um, And there are, as you said, different levels or degrees of consciousness. And even in our own case, most of our mental activity is unconscious. Um, The unconscious mind plays a huge part in our lives. Our habits are usually unconscious. When we dream, suddenly amazing things happen to us or we're within these amazing dreams which we've not consciously invented, uh, yet they're coming to us through our unconscious minds. Uh, So I think all of this is actually true of all nature. And spiritual practices are ways of breaking out of our isolation, the idea that it's all just inside the head, into recognizing these much deeper and wider connections. And that's really one of the reasons I wrote this book, Science and Spiritual Practices. Well, I can just say that it is a really wonderful book. I have it on the uh, desk in front of me right now. And um, 
I want to thank you so much for being with us today on Shattered Reality Podcast. We have Rupert Sheldrake, uh, who has written 12 books, and uh, his latest is Science and Spiritual Practice. I want to just close by telling you a, a synchronicity that occurred. I belong to a uh, an intentional group with a, a group of um, remote viewers, and um, one of the, while I was preparing this uh, interview for today during this past week, one of these um, remote viewers uh, put a. Um, a posting up to the the intentional group's uh, Facebook page, which is private, uh, but it's I'm not I'm not letting any uh, secrets out of the bag, so to speak. But what he put up was your lecture uh, from the YouTube is the Sun Conscious, and I just felt that this was an incredible synchronicity since the night before I had been listening to the very same lecture on YouTube. Uh, that you gave. Very amazing that that coincidence happened. Yes. Mm. I am all for synchronicities in, in my life. And so I want to thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, for being our honored guest. I'm giving you oodles of gratitude uh, as per science and spiritual practices. And um, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank- doing this, Furusha. Thank you for putting out your series and, and um, helping to open up minds and, and indeed spread gratitude. Why, and thank you. And we're going to say goodbye now uh, to Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, a fabulous, interesting scientist, a biologist from England. Uh, have a wonderful evening across the pond. Thanks very much. Okay, bye now. So, uh, Shattered Reality listeners, this was a very, very wonderful um, experience to talk to Dr. Rupert Sheldrake. I had the honor of meeting him back in November in New York City, uh, thanks to a very dear friend of mine and uh, named Karen Page. I hope she doesn't mind me uh, stating her name here. Next up on Shattered Reality, we will have a, uh, a discussion about magic stores, um, not magic stores that sell tricks, but magic with a K, sometimes known as botanicas, sometimes known as grigri shops, and I'm sure there are various other names in other cultures, but they're pervasive uh, in the world. They sort of operate a little bit sub rosa beneath the uh, the radar of a lot of people, and th- there's one in almost every uh, major city and generally more than one. We're going to talk to um, one of the uh, one of the earliest botanicas in New York City, the owner and, um, of, of that botanica. And uh, we're going to also have uh, uh, David Metcalf, who has studied uh, botanicas, grigri shops, magic stores in other locations. He's going to be our guest along with Jason Mizrahi of Original Products. So that's coming up next. After that, uh, we're hoping to have on um, Greg Bishop and his co-author uh, for A is for Adamski. I am sorry. It's going to come to me as soon as I get off the air. The co-author's name. It's on the back of my tongue somewhere. And um, I'm also interested, Shattered Reality listeners, if you have a suggestion for a guest uh, who would be uh, good for the Mandela effect discussion. It's been coming up more and more recently, and there are some um, theories about it that are really out out in left field and others that are a little bit more mainstream. I'm looking for a guest that can discuss all of the aspects of the Mandela effect without either being too pedantic about it or too too far gone about it. If it, uh, I can't think of a better way to express it. Also, I wanted to ask all of you listeners to like us 
on Facebook, like us on shatteredrealitypodcast.wordpress.com and shatteredrealitypodcast.com, our two websites. Uh, as well, many of our podcasts are on YouTube, and you can make a comment on any of these sites, and we will hear it. Uh, but we have had requests for a guest on the Mandela Effect, and I would like to follow that path up. So, hoping to greet Kate Valentine as well on our next show, but certainly soon. Uh, our co-host, Kate Valentine, has been absent for a while. She will be coming back uh, eventually. And uh, so now I am going to do our final. Goodbye from Shattered Reality. Goodbye.